Don't you dare come back here. You failure. For over 20 years, I thought I had been devoted to John. Yet, this is how John really felt about me. I wasn't leeching off him. I was just devoted to him. But now, I'm at a loss for words. As I felt all strength leave my body, John continued. Ryan's a working adult now, so you have no reason to depend on me, right? But... Quiet, I don't want to hear your excuses. John raised his voice. Oh no, it's hopeless. My feelings didn't reach him. At that moment, I felt something snap inside me. It was the sound of the thread of love that bound our hearts, breaking. Simultaneously, my feelings for John began to fade. We were married just a moment ago, but now I feel as if he were a stranger to me. John was just using me from the start. He never loved me. Otherwise, he wouldn't blatantly cheat and try to kick me out. I don't care what happens to such a man. No, I must utterly defeat him. With my mind made up, I looked up and stared straight at John. My name is Karen Johnson. I'm a 50-year-old housewife, married to John for 25 years. Our son, Ryan, was born a few years into our marriage and has just graduated college and started working. With parenting duties winding down, I was looking forward to pursuing my interests. That's what I'm thinking now. But there's just one problem. My relationship with John. John is far from a good husband or father. In fact, it's hard to find anything good about him. He cheats, and he doesn't even provide a proper salary. Please, can you at least contribute to the household expenses? Huh? Don't get cheeky with me when you're living off my earnings. John always retorts like this. Maybe it really is hopeless. Maybe divorce is the only option. I've been thinking about it a lot lately. But I can't just suggest divorce easily. My Phil, Bob, who is unwell and hospitalized, asked me to look after John. I owe it to Bob to endure as long as I can. His words can't be ignored. But my desire to divorce is strong. Torn between these conflicting feelings, I find myself reminiscing about the happier times before our marriage. The turning point that led to such happiness before my marriage was actually due to a misfortune that struck my father. Our family owned a small diner. My father was in charge of cooking and my mother handled the serving. Needless to say, the food was delicious. However, my dad was incredibly bad at business. He started the diner with a desire to feed customers delicious food to their heart's content. I think that's a noble cause. But he ran the diner solely on that sentiment hardly considering the profitability. It didn't matter to him if the profits were low. As long as the customers were satisfied with tasty food. Naturally, such a business. Of course, that would not be profitable. As a result, our family's finances were always tight. Even as a child, I took pride in seeing customers leave satisfied. So I never interfered with my father's business approach. However, when I was in college, a crisis hit. 
The company supplying ingredients to my dad's diner went bankrupt due to the recession. We've already paid this month's dues. If this continues, we might have to close our diner. We were already barely managing as it was, and there was no way we could spare extra funds. Seeing my parents so downcast made me anxious too. But as a college student, there was little I could do. And I doubted the bankrupt company could refund us. The only option seemed to be closing the diner. That's when a regular customer, a man, said something unexpected. Closing the diner. Such a shame for such delicious food. But with the supplier's bankruptcy, we'll end up in debt. Then let me help you personally to get back on your feet. This regular, who really did lend my father a substantial amount. I'm glad to help. I'll certainly pay you back. Don't worry about the money. Just keep making delicious meals. He said, leaving the diner quickly after. Later, my father started doing business with another food wholesaler. It seems that it was a major food wholesaler there, and the wholesale price of foodstuffs was lower than before. Luckily, our family diner was saved from bankruptcy. About a year later, my father and I went to repay the man. Then, while the man and my father were talking, a young man approached me as I was waiting. I hear you borrowed money from my dad. When I talked to him, he was the son of the man who lent us the money. His name is John, and he works for a man's company. You're pretty. How about going out with me? Me, with you? Why not? Think of it as a way to say thanks for the loan. It was true we were helped by the loan. And my dad had properly thanked him. I thought we owed no more than that. But then John whispered to me. Ungrateful diner's daughter. I could spread that around, you know. That's... I couldn't retort. Even if he did spread rumors, it wouldn't affect me much. But it could trouble my father. And what would the diner's customers think? With these thoughts, I couldn't refuse John's invitation. Reluctantly, I agreed to go out with him. With that in mind, I went out with John. To my surprise, I actually enjoyed it more than expected. John was fun to talk to and knew many exciting places to go. He chose the places we went to with great taste. And I started to think maybe he wasn't such a bad guy after all. That's where my luck ran out. I was quickly wrapped around John's finger. It's fun being with you, Karen. I'm having fun too. I never thought I'd consider marriage until I met someone sincere and good like you. His simple words swept me off my feet, and I began a relationship with John, considering marriage. John continued to manipulate me in various ways. Eventually, a few years later, I found myself married to him. Of course, I had no idea at the beginning of our marriage that it was all a trap. John seemed genuinely kind, and I felt loved by him. But it was all a lie. As soon as we got married, he showed his true colors. Here's my salary for the month. Make it work. I opened the envelope John gave me. Inside was a pay stub. The salary itself was deposited directly into the bank, so just having the pay stubs wasn't suspicious. 
However, the one thing that struck me as odd was that all the pay stubs were handwritten. Today, handwritten stubs are almost unheard of. But I got married 25 years ago. A time when computers were just beginning to become widespread and handwritten pay stubs didn't seem out of place. It's over $1,000. That's normal, right? I reassured myself. I managed with that small amount of money as best as I could. Over time, I started noticing something odd about John's routine. John leaves the house at a certain time every morning, but returns home at different times. It seemed to change from day to day. I'm busy with various jobs as my dad's successor. Then, at least call before coming home. Stop nagging. All right, I'll call. He'd shout. His attitude only heightened my suspicions. Maybe he was out playing around. Or even worse, having an affair. But his loud voice scared me from confronting him. Ultimately, even though I had doubts about John's behavior, I couldn't bring myself to say anything. Eventually, our son Ryan was born. I thought maybe things would change with a child. But John remained the same. Looking back, I think that's when I first started considering divorce. Then when Ryan was in middle school, I received a call from my mom while I was out shopping for dinner. What? Dad's in the hospital. My father had been admitted to the hospital. I rushed there immediately. Your mom's just exaggerating. My father laughed heartily. I was relieved. I suddenly remembered something that made my heart skip a beat. Oh no, I forgot to contact John. It was too late. My cell phone was flooded with missed calls from John. Panicked, I called John back, only to be greeted by his irritable voice. Where the heck are you? Get home and make my dinner. I'm sorry, my dad. What, your dad? John asked sharply. I answered in a small voice. Yes, he was suddenly hospitalized. What does your dad have to do with it? You're my wife, remember? John's shout made me flinch and close my eyes. I was terrified of his yelling but I knew I had to stand up for myself. I mustered my courage and responded, Isn't it natural to worry about my dad? I should be allowed that much, right? Shut up, don't talk back to me. No, I will say this. You would rush to Bob's side too, wouldn't you? I asked. John suddenly fell silent. I thought putting himself in my shoes would make him understand. But his response was beyond my wildest expectations. Huh, I'd ignore my dad even if he were hospitalized. After all, I don't need him. I was speechless. It had to be a lie. But I couldn't deny it. After much hesitation, I told John, I'm not like you. Sorry, but you'll need to eat out tonight. That was all I could muster. I hung up the phone, feeling numb. Since that incident, I truly lost all trust in John. It was then that I realized the happy times before our marriage were all an illusion. I, I see, John wanted a housekeeper, not a wife. I said to myself, feeling sad, but I couldn't just wallow in sadness. 
That's right. If I'm considering divorce, I need to start preparing. I began making plans for a divorce. Then, a few years later, Bob was hospitalized and his condition was quite serious. He might not be able to leave the hospital. I relayed the doctor's words to John. But John was unfazed. So, it's going to cost money, huh? Is money all you're worried about? Don't you understand? I understand. I'll talk to my brother. John contacted his brother, George, who was married but childless, to see if he could help with the hospital expenses. Can't you pay for it? We have Ryan and Karen here, and it's tough for us. John said, as if it were someone else's problem. It reminded me of the time my father was hospitalized. John clearly didn't care about Bob. I couldn't take it anymore. Enough, I'll figure something out and pay for Bob's hospital bills. Don't forget what you just said. John railed. I nodded firmly. In the end, my statement led to us bearing the cost of Bob's hospital stay. Moreover, Bob illness caused him to step down from his position as president. And John took over. Regardless, John seemed displeased that I had stepped in. Since then, he has barely come home. This was evident even when we discussed Ryan's future. John ignored my calls and didn't come home. Dad's not coming home again today, huh? I'm sorry, Ryan. I didn't mean to cause trouble. It's fine. I don't care about Dad. I want to go to a university in New York. That's right. Don't worry about the tuition. I'll manage it somehow. Soon, Ryan's admission to a New York university was settled. As expected, John didn't even see him off. Once Ryan moved to New York, the house felt empty. By then, John was only coming home about once a week. Could you transfer a bit more for Bob's hospital bills? Huh? I've already transferred over half my salary. It should be enough since you're the only one here. John's contribution was just a small amount of money. Clearly, only a fraction of his salary. His claim of transferring over half was undoubtedly a lie. I knew this, but I didn't have the energy to argue. Years passed and I received news of Ryan getting a job. Now that Ryan has a job, it might be time to talk about divorce. I had prepared for this over the years. The only thing left was timing. When and where should I bring it up to avoid conflict? These farts consumed my mind. It's not really about avoiding conflict is it? I laughed bitterly at myself. One day, after visiting Bob in the hospital, after chatting with Bob and returning home as usual, I was startled when I was about to open the front door. I didn't know why, but the front door was unlocked. Was it a burglar? I peeked inside cautiously. Then, I heard the TV and John's laughter from the living room. Relieved that John was home, I entered the living room. John was laughing loudly while watching TV. You're home. Yeah, just thought I'd tidy up the house a bit. Tidy up. I looked around as John suggested. Upon closer inspection, some items in the room were missing. 
Huh? It looks like some things are missing. Yeah, I threw them away. Your stuff. Threw away. My staff. Shocked, I rushed to my room. It was empty. My computer, TV, even my favorite mug, are all gone. Even the bed, everything was missing. What is this? I threw them out because they're no longer needed. Not needed. What am I supposed to do now? As I raised my voice, John frowned, looked away, and sighed. How should I put it? I'm tired of supporting you. What is that supposed to mean? I am your wife. I retorted, and John got irritated. He suddenly raised his voice. Do I have to spell it out? Don't leech off me anymore, you failure. For over 20 years, I thought I had been devoted to John. But this is how he really felt about me. I wasn't leeching off him. I was just devoted to him. Words failed. Me as my strength drained away, and John continued. Ryan's a working adult now, so you have no reason to depend on me, right? But... Shut up! I don't want to hear your excuses! John shouted. Oh no, it's hopeless. My feelings didn't reach him. At that moment, I felt something snap inside me. It was the sound of the thread of love that bound our hearts, breaking. At the same time, my feelings for John began to fade. We were married just a moment ago, but now he feels like a stranger. John was just using me from the start. He never loved me. Otherwise, he wouldn't blatantly cheat and try to kick me out. I don't care what happens to such a man. No, I must utterly defeat him. With my mind made up, I looked up and stared straight at John. What? Got something to say? Nothing. If you want me to leave, I'll do just that. I slammed the living room door with force and headed to my room. But there was nothing of mine left. Not even a single piece of clothing. Don't bother looking. It's all gone. I had the junk collectors take it away. Which company did you use for this? The flyers right here. That's the one. I picked up the flyer of the disposal company that was on the floor. While dialing the number, I told John, You're going to regret this. After saying that, I immediately left the house. The call connected shortly. Once I explained the situation, they readily understood. It seems they had felt something off about John's actions and had kept everything they collected intact. I'll be right over. Thank you so much. I said, expressing my gratitude before hanging up. Then I went to the disposal company. After thanking them, I had them move my belongings into a storage unit I had just rented. Relieved that my belongings were safe, you won't get away with this so easily. Grinding my teeth, I called Ryan and briefly explained the situation before saying, So, I've decided to move out, considering a divorce. That's what you should expect, okay? Ah, uh, okay, bye then. Ryan quickly ended the call. He seemed scared of me. Was I really that angry? I pondered as I put my phone back into my bag and headed to a nearby business hotel. 
In fact, I had already decided where to move. The reason was simple. I had been planning to talk to John about divorce soon. My plan was to divorce and start a new life there. Well, it's just happening a bit sooner than planned. Honestly, I wasn't in trouble. It was just an advancement of my plans by a mere two weeks. Two weeks in a hotel. What a waste. I couldn't help feeling it was wasteful. A typical housewife's habit. Maybe I should bill him for the hotel too. Well, brace yourself, John. I muttered to myself and started working on my post-divorce plans. After about 10 days living in the business hotel, John called me during lunch. As soon as I answered, he raised his voice. You, you stole my money. Huh, what are you talking about? Don't play dumb. It's about my dad's hospital bills. The hospital just called asking for payment. Bob, that is what it is. I fought, sighing in response. Ah, that. Just pay it yourself. I'm not involved anymore since you kicked me out. I've been transferring living expenses to you. You're supposed to pay for that. Sure, but isn't the bank book for that account with you now? I replied calmly, knowing well that there was no money in that account. I couldn't help but grin. I have the bank book, but there's no money in it. That's why I'm saying you stole it. I didn't steal anything. Don't lie. Who else could use it? He never thought the amount he transferred was too little, did he? I replied, exasperated. The money was always too little from the start. If there's no money for the hospital bills, why don't you use your allowance? My my allowance. John started to panic, clearly thinking I was unaware. Since the beginning of our marriage, John had been giving me handwritten salary slips to hide the fact that he was skimming off a portion of his salary. In other words, the money he skimmed became his allowance. I asked Bob once, how much is John's salary, you know? So, that's, ah. Uh. He seemed puzzled, but he told me. So I knew you were skimming money. When I told him this, John fell silent. A long silence followed. So long I wondered if the call had dropped. Then suddenly, John raised his voice. What's wrong with me using the money I earned? It's your fault for using up all the money I gave you. Okay, okay. And then? I want a divorce. I'll demand alimony. You need to pay back the money you used. John's words made me grin inwardly. I had him right where I wanted him. He couldn't back out now. I replied with a smile. Oh, thank you. I wanted a divorce too. Come over to my place for the divorce discussions. What? No. But I mean. You want a divorce, right? I've prepared evidence of your infidelity and I'm waiting. Though I couldn't see him, I could tell John was taken aback. By his faltering voice, Evidence of infidelity. What are you talking about? Don't play dumb. I have photographic evidence. Photographic evidence. I could imagine John's flistered expression. Holding back laughter, I continued. Well, I'll give you the address, and let's meet next Sunday to discuss it in detail. After giving him 
a certain address unilaterally, I quickly hung up. I've successfully pushed for a divorce. Now, if only I can make him apologize. It was going to be tough, but I was ready. On the agreed Sunday, I arrived at the meeting place before the scheduled time. He should be arriving soon. Looking around, I spotted John in the corner of my eye. Over here. I waved and called out. John looked up, startled. What? This place? Yes, I gave you the address, remember? But, this place? Whose mansion is this? John looked behind me. Where a mansion worth about one million dollars stood. It was much larger than a regular house complete with a garden, three stories, a basement, and even a home theater. A luxury car was parked in the attached garage. Pointing at the mansion, I smiled. This is my house. It's brand new and beautiful, isn't it? What, your house? Yes, I was planning to live here after the divorce so I had it built recently. Yes, the place I had summoned John to was my newly built house. Naturally, John, who had always thought of me as just a housewife, was utterly astonished. I pushed him from behind into the house and led him to the living room. Let's have our discussion. This is my lawyer. I introduced my lawyer, who was waiting inside. But John was too distracted to pay attention. He was looking around nervously. He seemed concerned about his surroundings, constantly looking around. Not even glancing at the evidence of his infidelity on the table or responding to me. It was hardly a conversation. Eventually, John asked in a low voice. How did you afford this house? Is that what's bothering you? I'm used, answering nonetheless. I just bought it normally. Liar! How can a housewife afford this? To buy a one million dollar house, one would typically need an income of around one hundred and fifty thousand dollars per year but I had that kind of income. So I calmly replied, I earned that much. Got a problem with that. No, but how? I was helping a friend with her company, and before I knew it, things ended up like this. Maybe. The story goes back a few years. When my father was hospitalized and we had a dispute, I decided to divorce. I started preparing for it, first by looking for a job. After the divorce, I needed a job to live. So I looked for a job that would allow me to live independently. But good jobs aren't easy to find. So I consulted my close friend, Susan. Why don't you help me with my work? Your work? What do you do? Land-based aquaculture. Land-based aquaculture is a method where pools are artificially created for farming fish. Though there are drawbacks, it's eco-friendly as it prevents ocean pollution. Susan's father started it and now she is running it. So, I started working there. John asked tentatively. After I started helping, the business suddenly began to do well. My role was mainly negotiation and administrative work. Susan said I was a huge help and I was promoted to an executive position. It was all coincidental, but luck is part of skill, 
I believe. Hearing my story, John slumped in defeat, but then suddenly looked up. Okay, let's forget the divorce. How about we start over? Despite his words, I replied with a cold gaze. What? Can you say that in your sleep? No, I'm serious. I really want to start over with you. John pleaded passionately. But I knew he was just blinded by my money. So I replied with raised eyebrows. I refuse to be with someone who cheats and someone who neglects their father, too. No, about my dad. I. Enough. You might not know, but I was the one paying for Bob's hospital bills. The money John gave me was really a pittance. After paying for groceries, utilities, and other miscellaneous expenses, there was never anything left. That's all he ever gave me. Let alone enough to cover Bob's hospital bills. Initially, I managed somehow, but after starting my job, I covered the bills with my salary. Despite that, you never listened to me, nor did you visit Bob. That's... Ah. Uh. I can't trust someone like that. As I raised my voice, John looked deflated. The lawyer then discussed the alimony with him. John couldn't say anything and just nodded until the end. Eventually, encouraged by the lawyer, John signed the divorce papers. The alimony was set at $30,000. Now that the divorce is finalized, you'll be paying for Bob's hospital bills from now on. I said as John nodded, seemingly unhappy, but not objecting. I felt relieved. In the end, I sent John away. Glad it was finally over. The only regret was that I couldn't get an apology from him. But I had one last move. With that, I was sure John would apologize. Thinking about it made me smile unintentionally. A few days later, on my way back from the office, someone called out from behind. Hey, Karen. I turned around to find John standing there. Don't be so familiar. We're divorced now. Shut up. What did you do? John looked at me, his face red with anger. I realized then. Ah. The talk must have happened at the company. Smiling, I deezed him. What do you think I did? Don't joke around. Tell me, how did you get me fired? John was stomping his feet in frustration. I couldn't help but smile at his amusing state. Isn't it your own doing, getting fired for having an affair with the office clerk? John's affair was with a clerk at his company, where he had acted recklessly, thinking he could do anything as the president. Right after the divorce was settled, I reported this to Bob. While he regretted the divorce, he was furious about John's behavior. I showed him the photographs of the affair, which infuriated him even more. Then he made an offer. I'm thinking of transferring all my shares in the company to you, Karen. To me, wouldn't it be better for George? No, I want you to have them. Use them to dethrone John from the presidency. That's what Bob had said. Bob's company was a corporation where shareholder resolutions are necessary to appoint executives. Although decisions can also be made by the board of directors. In smaller companies like Bob's, 
where he owned most of the shares. A single shareholder could make significant decisions. But in small companies, it's common for the president to own most of the shares. When I inherited all his shares, I had the power to make decisions alone. But it wasn't me who decided to fire John. I informed George about the affair and my new shareholder status. The rest was his decision. George was considerate. Why did he listen to you? It's not about listening to me. It's about what's best for the company. John collapsed on the spot and began to apologize. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. No. I'll be lost without a job. His predicament was none of my concern. It was all self-inflicted. I won't forgive you. Please, I'm begging you. It was all self-inflicted. I turned my back on him. Sorry, but there's nothing I can do. Why, if you have the shares? I sold them to George and his wife. I don't want anything to do with you anymore. At that moment, I heard John sobbing. But I walked away, pretending not to hear. John was eventually ousted from the company. Perhaps he could have stayed as an employee, but his arrogant behavior, starting from his entry through nepotism, made that impossible. I refuse to be an employee. He had said, once fired, he was out. Now he's reportedly working as a convenience store clerk, a difficult to find job at his age. He's likely to spend his old age in regret without money. As for me, post-divorce, I became more focused on my work. There's no talk of remarriage, but there are a few men among my colleagues. A new spring might come. While thinking this, I received a call from Ryan. I'm bringing my girlfriend over. Okay, I'm looking forward to it. I failed in marriage, but I hope Ryan doesn't. But I'm sure it'll be okay. Ryan is much more stable than I ever was.